Hi class. So we're moving into week 10. Um, this is going to be probably another short, uh, shorter lecture. I've got you listening to a podcast that's fairly long and a reading. Um, <clears throat> uh, I do, now that we're getting into week 10 and we're kind of moving into middle October, research papers should start to kind of uh, at least be part of your planning and thinking at this point. Um, so please email. I, Real quick, uh, an ethnography, again, if you don't know by now, is anthropologists going in the field. You guys are going to be doing many ethnographies, so going and observing an event that looks like a concert or a baseball game, um, and then interviewing people around their participation in that event, if they are cultural actors, uh, specifically focused on that um, research topic. Um, so at least two interviews and an event needs to be observed. Uh, if you have any further questions, please email me. As we get into uh, November, uh, I foresee having like a online Zoom kind of conference where people will be able to check in with me to, to see about the research paper topics. Um, and in fact, in a couple weeks, um, it'll probably be necessary for you guys to at least tell me um, via email what you're going to be doing your research on so that I can make sure that you're on the right track and you don't turn in a research paper that is not uh, kind of up to par. All right. All right. So in terms of anthropology and the study of politics and power, last week we really went into what divides leadership. And we talked about uh, band level egalitarians, tribal level uh, temporary headmen. Remember the big difference here is, is that headmen are temporary in terms of a conflict or a crisis in a moment, right? So they might have temporary leadership for a week, a month, two months, but they're going to return that. Big men or big women are going to have power for their lives, for the the, the rest of their lives. Um, and in fact, the Kawaiasu or Nuwa here in uh, the Tehachapi area, um, that's what they had. They had a big man. And it was based on prestige and a little bit of wealth. Moving into social hierarchy, but not a chiefdom. People call it a chiefdom, but it's not a chiefdom. It's not really a chiefdom until we start to pass down power, uh, ascribe status to our offspring. All right. Um, and then we get into state level society. And then we get into the modern state where they start returning some of these egalitarian principles. So we're going to kind of dive into politics and power and what that looks like. More on power, policy, and anthropology. I'm going to do a little bit of a, a conversation around... Uh, my work in the prisons um, and what that looks like in terms of anthropology policy. Um, so that's that's uh, a good segue into um, power. Remember, uh, two types of power, power over others and the power to do. Uh, remember, the more egalitarian you are, the more power to do is the thing. Power over is discouraged. Uh, when we move into uh, big men, big women, uh, chiefdoms, ancient state level, we're definitely moving into power over others. Um, cultures themselves are going to have different distinctions of power. Um, sometimes it's supernatural power, uh, like the shaman has control over some of the, the supernatural power stuff. Um, again, but these all could be classified in, in terms of power over and power to do. Um, sometimes the power to do can turn into power over. And this has everything to do with prestige and status, right? So again, let's say that that uh, Joe in the band is a really, really good hunter, okay? And before we're all egalitarian, but we decide that Joe is an extra, extra special hunter and he's a good leader. So his power to do and that talent of hunting um, earns him some more prestige. And instead of the group leveling him out so that he is... A member of an egalitarian band level society, we start to elevate him to a headman and then to a big man. Uh, we have definitely moved into relinquishing our power to do, which is uh, to lead and to um, make decisions individually through direct democracy or self-government. And we've passed that over. Okay, We've handed that over symbolically to Joe who is now going to have power over us to make decisions. This is what representative democracies look like, right? So we, 
in, in terms of voting, when we vote, we're hand, that's a symbolic gesture of handing our power to do and to make decisions on our own to other people. So this is, and, and it's not always symbolically transferred, right? Like sometimes uh, people take power. Excuse me. Um, so different cultures are going to have different kind of distinctions in this way, but I would say that most of them tend to have this, uh, this power structure and they don't, you can divide them power to do power over, but there's a, there's a, there's a gray line that, that can be crossed very, very quickly. Um, uh, the power over uh, that's this distinct kind of in our culture would be things like when we experience uh, elementary school, we, we talk about uh, bullying, like physical power over people, um, coercion, uh, bribery, those kinds of things are all power over. Um, and then, you know, when you get to the state level leadership, really like going to war and influencing other groups of people because you think that your way is right, ethnocentrism at the state level, uh, that is a power over process as well. Um, so colonial and imperial power coincides with the birth of anthropology. This is a fascinating thing that comes up. Um, realize that when, uh, colonial Western, uh, Europe and even Russia, um, and China on the East, when colonial powers were expanding into other regions, really, this is when, uh, anthropology starts to spring up. Uh, so it is really, really hard for us in the field to go back unless we go into places that, that have not been kind of uh, disturbed by the West or the East um, and indig truly indigenous people, uh, which did exist during this time period in the, you know, 1800s, 17, 1800s. Um, but anthropology is going to spring up when we pretty much already had these kind of power roles uh, negotiated with indigenous groups. Um, so we really can start to analyze what that power looks like, ethnographies, uh, the power of speech, uh, the power of the written word. Um, uh, you know, in the past, anthropologists, really well-meaning anthropologists, were still calling uh, people who were indigenous groups primitive. You know, and even after Boaz did all of his cultural relativity and stuff like that, primitive denotes people that are lower. It has a power context to the words. So. We need to be kind of mindful of where anthropology came from um, and what time period it came out of. A democracy and power, I kind of discussed this already, especially so two different times kinds in America. Uh, the representative democracy, where really the power to do is I have the power to self-govern myself, right? I have the power to, to, to make decisions in terms of what my life looks like, resources, those kinds of things. However, in a democracy at a state level, uh, when I vote or I don't vote, not voting is probably the worst thing to do because you now haven't passed over your power uh, to other people. And now they're going to have power over you even if you didn't vote. So voting uh, in terms of process and symbolic kind of gestures of power is vital. Uh, if you don't do it, you have no voice and didn't actually participate in the handing over of, of your power. Um, direct democracy. Again, uh, the David Graeber videos describe this as as a return to kind of this egalitarian mode where direct democracy is you voting on policy and or law, and that is power over the process. So that would be the other piece is that when we, in the representative democracy, when we pass over power to somebody, a representative or a president, we are basically, we are handing over our power over process. And the process could be economics, it could be uh, trade, it could be sociocultural things like the Supreme Court nominations, uh, it could be decisions to go to war. We are handing over that power of process. Um, and if we're not okay with that, then David Graeber has some, some points on moving towards a direct democracy, right? Um, political parties in power, uh, again, most countries, most countries, especially in Europe, have multiple political parties. I think the Netherlands has 11. Uh, Germany has something like that. And what they have is proportional representation. So political parties are represented at their congressional level or parliament. Um, we don't have that. We have a two-party system. Um, and this is why I really speak to binaries, especially in America. Western binaries exist in terms of wrong and right. Um, but I'd say that, that Europeans and Asian countries tend to have more of the dialectic going on still, where Americans are much more into their teams and political parties act as teams. Who's right and wrong, who wins, who loses, those kinds of things. 
Um, so those are all very, very important kind of aspects in terms of looking at political parties and power. Uh, again, we are handing over power not only to individuals, but to political parties because they're associated or affiliated with those political parties. So we really need to think about, do we want political parties and or ind these individuals to have the power over the process? And are they the only ones that we can elect to have that power over that process? Um, and then again, what, what kind of political power do we have? Uh, we have direct action, which is kind of protesting and organizing and trying to make change. Uh, in California, we can we can write initiatives to go on the ballot. Um, so we definitely have some much more power over the process, I would say, than than other states um, and even other countries, right? In terms of our direct democracy. Um, and the other version is us passing over our power of process. All right, political anthropology um, founded on studying social organization power and social agents. The Manchester School, started by Max Gluckman, really starts to look at uh, political anthropology, conflict, uh, and really um, conflict theory is what we really start to get into. Um, so they're really looking at, in the Manchester School, looking at relative stability. So in, we're really like starting to analyze uh, state level societies dictatorships, those kinds of things with political anthropology. Um, Max Gluckman believes that conflict maintained the stability of political systems through the establishment or reestablishment of cross-cutting ties among social actors. So what he's saying is that even our political elections cause cohesion. So this conflict of political parties and or electors uh, ultimately will have this, this battle and then once it's finished, then we kind of are reorganized and, and happy with the process because it, the process has now taken place. It's more of like a ritual. We've gone through the ritual together and that should form some cohesion. Um, and America hasn't seemed like that in the last, I would say more 20 years um, and maybe even longer, 25. Uh, we've really started to become much more in our political party kind of teams. Um, so this is uh, very different. Gluckman's using conflict theory out of Marxism. Marxism basically believed that there was limited resources to go around um, and at political actors or cultural actors battle over those resources. This is where you get the elite class and underclass. This is uh, what Marx would call bourgeoisie. It's the wealthy kind of uh, owners of, of industry. And then you have the proletari proletariats who are the workers. Um, and this conflict out of Karl Marx is kind of moving into what are the different kind of symbolic conflicts that we have. Um, I kind of discuss conflict theory on a knowledge transfer level at this point in terms of, uh, at least in the West, we tend to utilize knowledge in it as a limited resource. And if, if somebody has more of it or is louder and can portray themselves as being more knowledgeable, then they have more power. Um, and this is a fascinating thing that I think has happened kind of out of the Enlightenment era, to be honest, and, and everyone thinking that they should be part of the Enlightenment era. Um, Gluckman suggested that a certain degree of conflict was necessary to uphold society, and that conflict was uh, constitutive of, of social and political order. Uh, this, this actually starts to get into, and, and I don't know that you can actually disagree with this, I mean, if you term conflict as, as a disagreement. Um, internal dialectic, we do this with ourselves, we have battles or battles of ideas or conflicting ideas in our head, and we have to kind of work those things out. We do in society too, if somebody brings up another good point, we have to adjust to that in terms of our own ideology. Um, so this is, this is really where Gluckman's kind of talking about um, conflict as necessary. Um, I would say that it's more of a process that we should be focused on, on the, like the, that self and ideas are then, then have, have to uh, negotiate out other ideas and selves, and that that kind of looks like conflict. Um, and it may feel like conflict a little bit, but in reality, that's just people negotiating out uh, self and society, really. Uh, we're not, it's, it's not the conflict of battle. It's more symbolic conflict, I would say, of words and ideas and concepts that are having to be worked through by individuals. So Max Gluckman is, is important. Uh, Karl Marx is important in terms of uh, conflict theory, which has a lot to do with political anthropology.